Hello, everyone, and welcome to Willing to Learn, where we believe that when we know more, we can do more. I'm your host, Dr. Ashley V. Dominguez. Today's show, we have Brenda Lee Anderson. Brenda is a PhD candidate in the Center for the Study of Higher Education at the University of Arizona. Drawing on critical qualitative methodologies, her research scrutinizes and interrogates structural oppression in higher education that impedes the success of minoritized communities. Informed by her prior experience supporting survivors of campus sexual violence as a campus advocate, Brenda's dissertation examines how institutional conceptions of safety do or do not meet the needs of students with multiple marginalized identities. Welcome to the podcast, Bren. Thank you so much for having me. Ashley, I'm really excited to be here and share a little bit about my journey with your listeners. Oh my goodness, yes. And we were just talking about our secret obsession for Bravo. This is not the <laughs> that, but we both love it and we are going to talk about that soon. Um, yes. <laughs> but let's get to learn a little bit about you and your story because I, I find that oftentimes our histories, our origins really inform what leads us to do the work that we do. So if you don't mind just telling us a little bit more about you. Yeah, I think you provided a really good introduction of what or I guess who Brim is on a piece of paper, right? But as you said, like our origins, our stories like really inform who we are and what we do. If I'm thinking about myself and how I got to where I am today, I think the big arching word that I've really been thinking about in terms of getting prepared for this podcast, but also just being a community with you outside of this podcast is the word community. I would not be here today without people who showed up for me in my life in many, many seasons. I was born in Toledo, Ohio, but I was raised in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, Cleveland, Tennessee. It's actually gotten bigger since I left for college. And I actually remember when I was like leaving for college, I was like, I'm never going back. And I literally, I go back for, I guess, the holidays. But I was like, at 18, I was like, I'm not returning home. Right. Um, <laughs> for yeah. getting out. And then you're like, okay, I'll go back. Yeah. And so I'm a first generation high school graduate. I'm one of six kids in my family. I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school, which is bizarre, but very real for a lot of people. So I have three older siblings and there's me and I have two younger siblings. And when I think about like my college journey, I would hear about college, but it wasn't something that I felt like I could actually obtain just because I was very much like middle child, show up for your family, right? Show up, support. And when I was in high school, I worked multiple jobs to help take care of my family. I do identify it as a former foster care youth. And so I was in and out of the system my whole life. And then there's other pieces, right, where incarceration, um, having both my parents incarcerated for large amounts of time really informed like how I come into the work that I do. And I really contend with the question of like answerability, like why this, why me, why now, um, that Dr. Lee Patel talks about, right? So it's not just like consuming this work, like going in, but also how is this work both deep and meaningful and how am I doing this work in a way that is focused on healing and some type of justice? And so I talked a little bit about this in other settings, but I still remember the day that I was accepted into college. I applied to college, right? I was working at Chick-fil-A and I hated it for multiple reasons. And everyone was like getting prepared for college, right? And they're like, oh, hey, like, do you have plans? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, yeah, I would love college, but I had this fear of like what it meant to leave my younger siblings, right? Because of the instability and the fact that like I was at that point, right? Not the grown up, but the most stable person in my family, right? And so I remember that day like it was yesterday. My mom called me and she says, hey, baby, we going to college. And so I remember that because it wasn't like, hey, Bren, you're going to college. It was, hey, baby, we going to college. And so when I went into academia, right? When I went into being a first generation college student, it was never just about me. It's also about like, how is my trajectory in education? How does my trajectory within the academy look like both for me and my family? And so um, I grew up in a Black v. Black household. Um, I love to tell people that uh, my family celebrated Juneteenth before Juneteenth was like pink washed and like on Walmart ice cream. And so in my community, right? 
Juneteenth and these different things, it was about like showing up, but also like focusing on just like Black joy and Black healing, right? I grew up learning that my family was enslaved, right? But it wasn't necessarily about, oh, we're enslaved, but it was honoring our ancestors, but also understanding that like you're literally standing on giants, right? Those people have paved the ways for you. So um, when I went into undergrad, I got involved in organizing because my granddad was very much a part of the Black power movement. I have photos of him, this big ass fro, his power fist. And I would hear all of these stories about Black liberation theology, Howard Truman, right? And really thinking about in the world, people are suffering and you don't ask yourself, well, what is that person going to do? But really think about like, how can I help support a more just and like freer society? And fast forward a little bit, like when I was an undergrad, I was overly involved in BS, you are Black Student Union. I was also dealing with some of my own identity things because I had decided to join a predominantly white sorority, which I think that's a conversation for another day. But I also think in those experiences and being a member of Chi Omega fraternity, I was the only Black woman that had went through recruitment, got a bid to what you would know in the South as like the top house. And I remember I had gauges in my ears, like a pair of vans on some cargo shorts. And I remember the day like people had like Lily Pulitzer and like all these fancy brands. And I think that should have been like my sign to like run as far <laughs> as I could. But I really think like in those moments of being in BSU, right, advocating for Black students' needs, but also being a member of a white predominantly, well, it's not predominantly, it is just white. Like, let's actually name that. Like, I shouldn't be saying predominantly. Like, it's a white ass structure um, and organization. Sorry for cussing. Later in my development, I remember reading a research article by Chris Linder where she talked, Dr. Chris Linder, where she talked a little bit about the identity development of women of color in predominantly white spaces. And I remember reading the article and I didn't even know who Dr. Chris Linder was. And I was like, this person is my soul mom. Like, have you ever read some research? And you're like, is this person interviewing me? And I started to like really understand like, wait, me being in Chi Omega fraternity really propelled me in ways to think about my identity development because I was at this nexus of like this very white space, but also doing organizing in the community, right? Around things like the GED. And to being a first generation high school student, doing the organizing around the GED and the changes to the GED, that's actually what propelled the rest of my family to get their GED. So at that point, right, I was out there in the streets organizing, getting cited, getting arrested because of the changes for that were coming to the GED. And I remember calling my dad and my dad's like, remember, you need to finish school, you need to finish school. And I said, yeah, dad, but it's so important. Like, we have to show up for our people. This isn't just going to impact future generations. It's impacting people now. And my dad said, okay, if you're really invested in education, like I'm going to go back to school. And so next thing you know, my dad goes and gets his GED. My brother goes and gets his GED. And when I was graduating from undergrad, right, my dad was graduating from technical school. And so it was this beautiful thing that I got to see where my dad loves to joke around how he got a 4.0. And I'm like, dad, if you worked right with your hands for years and then someone's like, come in and take a test. Like, <laughs> I kind of give them shit because I'm like, you already knew all the content because you taught yourself, but also we can have conversations about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was graduating with my master's degree, I got to experience my brother, David, graduate with his associate's degree. And so really being that trailblazer. And in between time to speed it up, I was a NASPA NUF fellow. So I got the opportunity to intern at the University of Vermont, the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I had mentors who really helped me think critically about institutions of higher education. I will acknowledge in that time, right, like many young folks, I was drinking the Kool-Aid and we can talk about that, right? This is how I came into my study in that cognitive dissonance. I ended up going to the University of Georgia where I had an amazing faculty members, Dr. Darius Means, who was my mentor, as well as like Dr. Mary Lee Dunn, Dr. Chris Linder, and so many other brilliant people who really just developed me, right? I was the master student that they didn't know what to do with. So I come in and I'm like, I want to do research. And they're like, well, master students aren't usually on research teams. And I'm like, but Bryn is, right? And so I was the first ever master student that was invited to be a part of a research team at the University of Georgia. And so I got to learn from like PhD students to learn about putting together um, research and asking deep questions and then took a job at the University of Arizona as a counselor, case manager, and I was hired as a part of a list of demands from Black students who are organizing 
And that really informed me because it was in 2016 when we were dealing with not only like the mass murders of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people um, by policing and brutality, but also thinking about Trump's presidency. And I'll be honest, right, if I could go back to Bryn, who was graduating with her master's degree, I don't think I would have came to Arizona knowing what I know now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm currently a PhD candidate in the Center for the Study of Higher Education, as you shared, and I'm a Spencer Fellow, a National Academy of Education Fellow. I'm a proud fellow. And every day I wake up, I actually was talking to a staff member with the National Academy of Education yesterday, and I made a joke. I was like, does NAD, like the National Academy, know they picked me? And they're like, yeah, like we picked you. And I was like, I have to literally wake up every day and say, it's an honor to be a National Academy of Education fellow, right? It's an honor to be able to have funding to focus on something that has the potential to really change education. But it also reminds me about to never, ever give up on your dreams. And I think kids like me who grew up in the hood, like we're always told, right? Like you can dream, but that might not come into fruition. But every morning I just remind myself dreaming and having hope and having desire is a thing that will liberate you, right? It's not seeing the tangible things now. I'm not saying that. And I don't want to confuse this of NAD has liberated me. Like, no, it's still a structure, right? It's still an organization. But I think this experience and everything that I've gone through, as I'm sure we'll talk about, to get to where I am now, it's like kids in the hood, we don't get the dream. And so I dream of an abolitionist future. I dream of a society where folks have what they need to not only survive, but thrive. And so that's what I hope my work will do. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about my dissertation and what that looks like. And I just hope that this conversation serves as a way for other scholars to Number one, not give up on themselves, but also think about how, again, community propels you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to highlight here just not only the importance of you breaking generational cycles and navigating higher education and being a strong influence for your own family, for them to want to pursue school, be it a GED or an associate's degree, and how you were really pioneering that force in your family. And how powerful that is and, and what pride that that may, that instills in you to be able to say, yeah, I was a part of that. Like I helped change the, the future and the course of this family. So potentially future generations of our family can move beyond just the high school diploma. Or Yeah, I think you bring up some really good points with that because it's interesting. I remember the first time I went home after like my first semester a lot of stuff was happening, right? Like we had a tornado in our town. My parents' roof got like taken off and I actually failed all of my classes and lost my scholarships. And I remember like being home in like just the unstable environment and reminding myself like I could actually go to bed when I was on a college campus. Mm -hmm. For the first time in my life, like I didn't have to think about like if someone was ripping or running in the house, if I was going to hear a gunshot, if I was going to like just be afraid to go to bed because of just like the instability or if the cops were going to bust in, right? Like I was like, I have to focus on my degree, right? And when, and it's like messed up, right? But when your stability and safety is tied to an institution, but institutions in themselves are violent, like that's messed up. Mm -hmm. And so you bring up really good points because when I went home, I remember I was so afraid to tell my family and I would get excited because I'm like, these are all the things that I'm learning. And one of my siblings, actually no, it was my sibling, it was actually my mom. She said, don't bring that university shit into my house. And I was like, what? And I was just like so excited about some advocacy work that I was doing, right? I remember the feeling and I'm like kind of externally processing right now. And I was like, even if, right, you go and you obtain these things, like there is that tension that it creates in your family. Right. And so even though I was a pioneer, there was like this double-edged sword of like, there's the good, it's like a both end, right? Like you can experience these amazing things and- it creates a somewhat chasm. Because now you're different than your family. Mm -hmm. You're not yeah. maintaining the status quo of what has been the norm, right? Yep. You're departing from that. And that can be painful for your mm -hmm. family to see. And I've even experienced this in my own family where it's like, oh, well, if you go to college, you're going to get brainwashed. And what if you mm -hmm. don't agree or what if you start looking at me differently? Mm -hmm. No, I'm still Bryn from the hood, but my family calls me, yeah, my family calls me Beely. <laughs> um, and I, I actually appreciate that because I think sometimes in the academy or in like, well, the academy is corporate America. 
it is so easy to like live in a bubble. And I go home and I'm reminded like, damn, people are actually still out here making a way, right? With no resources. <laughs> um, and so, and, and, and I noticed that too, when you t- talked about like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, first time at college, but I'm going to go get involved in organizing efforts or I'm going to go get my master's. And even though other master's students don't, are not typically a, a part of these research projects, I'm going to make a way to get myself in those spaces. Mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how, where that comes from? What qualities or mindset helps you put yourself in situations, A, that maybe you're not previously used to and uncomfortable in and find a place to belong, even if there are these pressures or people that you're going to encounter along the way who remind you that you don't? Honestly, I think like my granddad, my dad and my mom. So my granddad grew up in like deeply segregated South, right? And really learning like, he was one of 16, like black women were out there having kids, right? Like, (laughs) and he was actually the first one in his family to go off. And it's kind of, it's not bizarre, but like my granddad joined the military, but he was like actually anti-military and made me and my siblings like make a promise of that we would never join the military because he's like, it is not a place for like black people or black women in general. But that's a conversation and like another way. But I think like him being that trailblazer and having an eighth grade education and joining the military and understanding like even though he was in the military, he still experienced discrimination from people who were supposed to be like his colleagues, right? Like who were supposed to like take the same oath as him. Right. And then I think about my dad and my mom. My mom is biracial. Like she grew up in the South, like Birmingham, Alabama, no, Montgomery, Alabama, right? To a white mother and a black dad. Essentially, one of the things I was always told, and maybe not the most eloquent ways, because like my mom is not going to give you like the feedback in a little sandwich, right? She's just going to say what she needs to say and keep it moving. But it was always this idea of like the answer is no, right? You live in a society because of the color of your skin, because of like how you're situated. The answer is always no. You can only make it a yes. So if you're always going to say, well, I'm not going to put myself out there because of reject rejection or they're going to say no then essentially like the answer will always be no and I think like even in that as like I'm processing right like there's some messed up undertones in that right Right. of like were my parents particularly thinking about assimilation right were they thinking about when they were telling me these things that I needed to be a particular type of way in order to quote-unquote survive But I also think about like when I had these moments of stability in my life through like my foster parents who like I'm still super close to this day. Like the day that I got married, I remember like my foster dad actually like came to the wedding and like prayed over me and my partner. Right. And my foster parents were there because I see them as like my parents. Right. Like four different families. (laughs) Like at this point, I have four dads, four moms, lots of black aunties, lots of cousins, lots of kinship that works. And anytime I was in these spaces, right, I was always told, like, if the answer is already no and you're making it a yes, when that answer becomes a yes, it's what you do with that, right? And so how are you also thinking about reaching back into your community, right? How are you also thinking about bringing other people with you? So you don't just walk in a door and close it and now allow anyone else in there. And so I hate the analogies of, like, a seat at the table because I don't really need a seat at the table. Like, I don't. Like, I think that idea is also rooted in like really messed up things and it's like community gets you places but when you get to a place right you don't forget about that community and so for example like when I was at Georgia and I was the first master's student that was invited on to a research team under the guidance first I was with Dr. Mary Lee Dunn and I really appreciated this the study was about poverty right University of Georgia is this massive like top tier institution, right? The birthplace of higher education. And it's surrounded by like housing projects. So going into this beautiful campus, I'm like, those are like the apartments that I grew up in as a kid. And I had this group of researchers who were trying to think about how students, privileged students, right, at UGA were learning about poverty because of where they were situated next to like where the campus was situated. And so in those conversations, I remember like the mass, the doctoral students and even Dr. Dunn would be like, you bring such a different perspective, Bryn. You bring such a different perspective. And it was like, yeah, I'm bringing like the years of like living in the hood, right? 
and having the educator come in and be like, hey, can you fill out this survey? Or hey, for remember when those McDonald's like coupon books Mm -hmm. were a thing? They would (laughs) come. They would like, especially around Halloween, they would come out and you get a dollar for like the Sundays and like the researchers would come in and be like, if you come and do this, here you go. Like me and my siblings, we were rolled up six deep. We're like, we're getting one for all of us. I want to make sure we have food for like the rest of the week. And just really thinking about like, it's never been just about me. It's about community. Mm -hmm. And I think like just the people in my life really just said, the world is a weird place. The answer is going to be no. But when you get a yes, don't close that door. How do you bring your community with you? I mean, I love that, especially because oftentimes we hear no, especially in academia. And I think sometimes think like, oh, I got a no, like the end. And it's like, no, 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 no. Keep pushing, especially in this sphere that we work. You're going to get a lot of no's. You're going to get a no as a master's student, as a PhD student, Mm -hmm. as a career scholar, as a tenured scholar. Be prepared for the no's. But the no's Mm -hmm. should not paralyze you. The no is not the final line in the sand. Yep. And and that's what I really appreciate through your storytelling is that, okay, expect the no. But so what? Mm -hmm. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Keep pushing. Find your people. Find your community. And keep pushing forward. And that seems like that's exactly how you've approached your life and especially in academia. I was taking a look now at your Google Scholar. You've already published since 2018 seven pieces as a grad student, which is really incredible. Yeah, I got some more coming. I think I have to just like, it's wild because that's like Google Scholar. And it's like, if you would have told Bren, baby Bren, that I would be a published author, I'd be like, wait, what? But again, like library was like my safety spot. Like I would be at the library and reading and dreaming because it was like, shit, if I can stay here until 9 p.m. and I get home, I can be to bed in 30 minutes and then next day at school and just do that over and over again, right? And Google Scholar is one part of it. Uh, I like to joke around about, you know, team type and cry, but I love learning. And I think that also is like what's been amazing. And none of those citations, right? None of those articles could have been done without community, without people who really believed in me. And I think in academia, And this will go into like talking a little bit about preparing for Spencer and competitive fellowship applications. Like academia is so individualized, like it is, and it can become a very toxic place, right? Where we love to not talk about it, but inherently it's like competitive. It's about like who you know, who you don't know, right? And because of that, like individualism is perpetuated. And so when people look at my resume and you're actually reminding me, like, I need to go in and like update it because I think I actually have like 12 peer reviewed articles. Um, Yeah. And so it's been like an amazing weirdness because people, number one, like, again, I couldn't have done that without community, but similar to what you were saying about no can paralyze you. So if someone, if you're coming into a program, right, and you're this eager learner and People are just so consumed with their day to day or like, I have to just go get tenure. And the only thing I can do is focus on tenure and focus on, you know, the things that I need to do for like young, eager grad students like that can be so like just messed up. And so I'm thankful that like people, especially someone who has ADHD and growing up like in schools in the hood, right? If you were over eager, then that was something that was like looked at as, oh, you're just like wild, right? But in my master's program and in my PhD program, like my eagerness and my desire to learn was something that I think was really matured and looked at as like a strength, right? And something that was cultivated. And so I would have never been able to be where I am in terms of like publications and like my writing and my ability to think across like different conceptual, like conceptualizing things to think through theory or think with theory if it wasn't for people like my advisor, Dr. Regina Dallamin, right? My community members like Dr. Britt Williams at Vermont, who I was on her, I was a master's student. She was a PhD student on that research team, right? Who like took me under her wing and was like, Bren, I got you. And it's consistently shown up for me, right? And then with Dr. Regina Dallamin, like I was given a speech at a first generation conference and I had never met Regina, but I heard of Regina because I've read her work and I'm like 
not even just undergrad. I was reading Rena's work in undergrad. And then my master's program. And in the crowd, she comes up to me and she's like, have you ever thought about getting a PhD? And it's like, <laughs> Sounds huh? like her. <laughs> Straight yeah, to the point. Like, and I looked at her and I was like, I hate the University of Arizona. And she's like, give me a call. And I'm like, oh, God. And so, again, like, I wouldn't be here without people who really just cared for me and, like, protected me around, like, not protect me around individualism, but, like, did the opposite of that. They actually, like, see things in terms of collaboration, right? Of, like, Yes, I need to get tenure. I need to get to my next step, but I'm also going to bring students along. I'm also going to bring other people along. And then as I started to develop like confidence, I was like, I'm going to lead my own work. And so it's been trial and error. Like I've gotten a lot of no's. Like I know right now I'm talking about the yeses, but y'all, I cry all the time. I've ran so many marathons and half marathons in this PhD program because I like to talk about the fact that if I can run, I just shut my brain off. And then by the time I'm done with that, I'm like, all right, it's in a box. <laughs> okay. so let's talk about that for, for graduate students who are thinking like, wow, like how does, how do I get opportunities to publish like that? How, you know, if I look up to Bren that she's been able to make these relationships, forge these connections, have people take her under her wing and, and it's been really a fruitful collaborative experience. How do I get those types of experiences? What, what advice would you offer them? I think I'm giving myself some advice because I struggle with this. <laughs> Send that damn email. I become paralyzed. And I don't think it's anyone's issue but the academy. I think we put people on pedestals, right? I think we read people's work, but we don't truly know who they are. And because of that, you then create this narrative of like who that scholar is or who that person is. But at the end of the day, like they're a human and like they're flawed. Like they're flawed just as we are, right? And send that damn email, right? But when you're sending that email, know exactly what you need. So I think I learned early on. Um, it's not early on. I think especially after COVID, our society is so like we doom scroll. So we're just scrolling all day. If it's not on like Instagram or X, remember, I'm a part of black Twitter. So Twitter, not X. <laughs> I think sometimes like if you're not intentional about sending the email, it's easy for people to just like scroll and just keep on going because we did that multiple years because we were all stuck in a house, right? Um, and we haven't gotten out of that. And so send the damn email, but be mindful of what are you asking for? What do you need? And also just like send the email and ask to engage with their work, right? But also like, it's not just about your work, but I would love to like, just to get to know you as a person. Mm -hmm. When it was announced that like, I was a National Academy of Education fellow, people came out the woodworks. Really? It was wild. Okay. It was wild. Um, okay, so let's so let's get into that because <laughs> we have talked about the power of no's, but we're we're gonna get into a big power of yes now. You are a 2023 Spencer Dissertation Fellow. Big congratulations. This is Thank you. a huge award, very prestigious award. Uh, but oftentimes I feel the conversations on how does one get inspired or encouraged to apply? What's that process look like? You find you get the award. What's the reaction? So let's go back to why did you apply in the first place? Yeah. And I'm just going to be transparent. I know this is going to be on a recording for the rest of my life, but hey, uh, I was your student affairs professional who worked and went to school full time. And I realized that like I was a better researcher and academic than I was as a practitioner. When you grow up, and your orientation is to justice, right, is to thinking about how systems of oppression impact not only you, but your family and other communities, you can no longer turn off that critical brain. And I'm not saying that people that currently work in student affairs aren't critical, but I came to a point where it was like, yeah, I'm actually advocating against the institution that hired. How is that positioning me as a Black, queer, non-binary person in a very particular way, Right. And it's very, very interesting. I was exhausted and I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I remember when I was preparing for fellowship applications or thinking about them, I was very clear with Regina, like, I want to apply for Spencer. Like, what are other things that I can do? Because this is just like not sustainable. And I also, at that point, as you talked about, I was writing and I was on so many different research teams that like the work and the research, sorry, the practice was informing the research, but the research wasn't informing the practice. 
And we see that a lot in higher ed, right? We can go out, we can do this work, but then like there's a disconnect because of institutions. And so I was very open and I just kept saying, hey, I want to apply for this. Um, but why so, did you have that in your mind to apply? Did someone suggest it? Did you hear about it from someone, a, a peer, a professor? I knew there were options for funding. How I came to understand what Spencer was or the idea of Spencer and National Academy of Ed is because my uh, mentor, Darius Means, was named a National Academy of Ed fellow. Okay. And I remember I was on Twitter and I was seeing this and I was like, oh, like, this is fancy. Like, what is this? Like, this is like, I thought it was MacArthur, honestly. I was like, I remember being like, congrats on MacArthur. And Darius was like, I'm not a MacArthur fellow, but I appreciate it. <laughs> And so then I would be in these circles, right? And I would meet other like fellows and I would hear about like the Dr. Amanda Ticinis, who also is a postdoc. And then my advisor was a postdoc fellow. And then I was like just exhausted, right? In terms of being a practitioner and being brutalized by the institution and realizing that the people who hired to advocate me hired me to literally advocate against them. It was like this weird thing that Regina sent me, well, she sent like everyone on the Educational Leadership Policy and Practice listserv. The Writing Center does this like summer development opportunity research fellow program where you get paired with a graduate student who has been awarded a nationally competitive fellowship and they help you develop like a first rough draft. And so during COVID, I wasn't doing anything, right? Like, well, I was doing things, but like I was stuck in the house. Right. And so I applied for the program. I got in and the application I actually focused it on because no one had gotten Spencer outside of like postdocs, but they had already left U of A. They actually had me writing my fellowship for the American Association for Undergraduate Women because there were like graduate students who had gotten that. And like, they also have grad students who were mentors who had gotten like NSF, NSF, um, you were writing these two applications at the same time. I was focused on AAUW, First. the American Association. Yeah. So this is two years out. Okay. And during that time, I did that. And it was like a year out. And then that following summer, I went back in and I said, okay, I'm not going to apply for the Association for Undergraduate Women. I'm actually going to apply for Spencer. And the reason why I decided to apply for Spencer was because it was my plan was to quit my job. Right. Before the trauma and all the stuff that happened, my plan was to quit my job because I was like, there is no way, given my dissertation subject, given my topic, I'm already tired writing a proposal and like writing in general. There's no way that it would be sustainable for me to be able to like work and complete a dissertation. And it would be disingenuous to my participants. Right. So if I'm saying I'm centering the most marginalized, I need to center my study participants. If I'm saying I'm taking a standpoint theory, right. I need to center and literally take that up. And so it was like a, a all or nothing. I had literally was like, I can't do it. And I remember telling Regina, like, if I don't get funding, like my plan is to take out some student loans. Like I want to be able to focus on my dissertation because in so much, right, it was Brent not only is focusing on writing a proposal, but she's working 80 hours a week. And then she's also publishing and on this research team. Like I not saw it also as an opportunity. Yeah, and I saw well, it honestly married. as a you still have family. You still have doggies and, and all the other things in your personal life that you're navigating. And, and y'all, I got like 15 best friends, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an organizer. Like, so it was a lot, right? It was unsustainable, and so it was like a, a all or nothing, right? And so I decided to apply for the National Academy of Education. This is really funny. I snuck into a Spencer party at ARA, ARA <laughs> American Education. <laughs> Search Association. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So they have actually gotten really strict. Um, <laughs> but like, <laughs> y'all, friend does not listen to no's. <laughs> Do you take away so, anything from this combo? <laughs> no's mean nothing. <laughs> it was so funny. Okay, so like San Diego happens, right? And someone's like, oh, there's a National Academy of Ed, a National Academy of Ed Spencer reception. And I remember one time I was in the circle and they talked about how Spencer had great food. And remember, I'm in grad school. So the only thing I could think about was the food. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to find out how to get in there. And I remember 
like walking in it was like on top of this like roof in san diego and the person was like signing people in i was just like <laughs> in there and i remember later i saw regina my advisor there and she's like you're gonna find your way how to get in a place i was like you know me and so then i was in the door and i'm looking around and it's like i've engaged your work i've engaged your work i've engaged your work oh my god oh my god how do i go have a conversation with these people so I let myself just be myself, right? I'm over here literally standing to like standing next to people that, you know, like, again, I have made that comment of like, oh my God, this is my soul mom. They don't know I exist. It was like one of those like nerding out academia moments. And I had to just remind myself, like, these people are human, like they're human. Mm-hmm. And after that, the Spencer like officials, they gave a overview of like what Spencer was. And I really enjoyed how they were committed to funding opportunities that would have an impact or had the potential, right? And I'm going to use potential, had the potential to change the face of education. And I was like, oh, and then I was talking to other grad students, right, who had been working on their applications for like years. And I was like, I'm so behind. I am so behind. So you have Um, other grad students who are applying for the dissertation fellowship who have been working on their application for years. For years. Like literally years. And at this point, how long have you, had you started working on your app? I hadn't. I had just found out about National You're Academy of Ed, Spencer. Okay. Like, I, you know, I knew like a postdoc, right? And you see the like Twitter announcements, but then I'm going to the party and I'm realizing like, oh, sh-. like not only are the appetizers great, but like, this is a huge deal. <laughs> Like, like money, I'm gonna be fully funded to do my research. We <laughs> offered snacks, like yo, yo, and look at all these amazing scholars that I can learn from and and share space with. Yeah, so yeah. I remember afterwards, I left from San Diego and I sent Dr. Means a text, right? And it's honestly again community because I remember I love my advisor, right? And she's cheap just like me, so. She's a, like, she's your black auntie, like Puerto Rican auntie, let's be correct. She's not tired, but she's like, let me help you help yourself. You're struggling. She's like, you can take a, a lift with me and we can save money. And I was like, hey, you're my type of person. So I remember like all my friends were eager once we got to the airport in San Diego to leave. And I'm like, well, Regina's offering me a ride. Like, why wouldn't I take the free ride? And I'm like, all right, we'll see. We're heading out. And in that moment, Dr. Amanda Ticini walks out. And I realized we're all taking a car together. Amanda was talking about how she was going to be at like ARA so she could like mentor Spencer and NAD, like dissertation fellows. So I was in this car ride and then I hear about these receptions and I'm like, I'm finding a way in there. And so I remember like the goal was how do I show up? So I get there and I see these people. And then afterwards I text Darius Mean and I was like, I think I'm going to apply for Spencer. And I'm like having a little confidence every time I'm like, I think I'm going to apply for Spencer. I'm having a little more confidence. I think I'm going to apply for Spencer. And then it was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. So that's April, right? The application. This is 2023. Yeah. Hold on. Time. So ARA last year, 2023, was in Chicago. So the year before was 2022. Yeah. We were in San Diego. And the application was due in November. Is that correct? October. It was due in October. Okay. In May, I met with Regina and I was like, yeah, this is my plan. And then I started to think about like letter writers and those things. And I just like, I hustled, literally hustled throughout the summer. And I felt like I was writing my proposal all over again. And my piece of advice is that, and I've learned this, it's very, very hard for me to ask for help. And I think there's a lot of socialization like with that. And I want to say it's hard for me to ask for help because I have, it's, been internal I've internalized like this idea of like well what if I'm a burden right like this person is busy and I, I've worked on that and I still am and my biggest piece of advice is like share your drafts with your kitchen table and I'll talk about a kitchen table well before you get to like September well before you get to September because Bryn I had invited four people to be a part of my kitchen table so my kitchen table was like the people, you don't just invite anybody to come have lunch, dinner with you at your family, like your table, right? And so there's like this level of vulnerability when you invite someone to your kitchen table, right? Because they're seeing your house, they're seeing your family, you don't know what's going to come getting up. Plot. Mm-hmm. Some of our most so, pieces, some, uh, usually a lot of the pieces that don't make it to the final stages, you're letting mm-hmm. them those aspects of the writing. 
and the work that yeah. you're speaking about. Okay, good. So I invited uh, Regina as my advisor, uh, Karina Salazar, who's on my committee, who's also a postdoc, which has been such a beautiful moment to be able to share that with Dr. Salazar. Like Karina is amazing and reminds me that like you can do this work and still be deeply ingrained in your community. I love Karina. I invited Dr. Britt Williams at Vermont because she's known Bryn since Bryn was out here doing weird stuff. And I invited Dr. Nolan Carrera because I took class with Nolan and Nolan actually challenged me in ways that I'm super appreciative of, right? I think that sometimes it's easy. He does this thing where he's like, you can't just explain, you have to explain and analyze. And so Nolan pushed me to like thinking about when I'm writing, right? Don't just explain, like explain, then analyze, right? Where he really helped develop that, right? And so that's like my kitchen table. I'm trying to think like if I am missing anyone. Oh, Dr. Jamaica Delmar, who is a professor of practice in our department. And she had, I remember when I had first asked her to be a, a part of my kitchen table. She's like, girl, I've never applied for this fancy stuff. But like, I'm going to show up for you because like, I think that like, you're going to be a Spencer fellow one day. And I was like, you really think so? I was like, I've been hearing horror stories of people who have applied like multiple times and like didn't get it. And like, again, remember, there's so much shit that's also happening in my life at this time that I could feel the pressure. And so. So these scholars comprise your kitchen table and they are, how soon are you sending them drafts? This is what happens. Okay. I have a transparent moment. They're like, hey, send me your draft. And I'm like, I will. And I would do the pivot, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because at that like, time. I'm not ready type of pivot. Like, yeah, oh. But like, yeah. I could have been ready, right? Because honestly, like, I was ready, but I wanted to be perfect. Let me actually just name it. I wanted to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, like, in the academy, because of socialization, when we put these scholars on pedestals, it's hard to acknowledge that. They're not perfect. So you don't need to be perfect. And so essentially what was happening is I was working two jobs. I was the director of a Black Cultural Center. And then I was also the director of a grant that was focusing on social justice. And I was supervising 15 people, literally 15 people. I was getting to work at seven and I was not leaving until 10. And then I would go to work on the weekends and spend hours working on like edits for my dissertation, like fellow application. You feel like the, the application in a way got put on the back burner one one too many times just because yeah. of all the cultures and responsibilities. So then four days before the application is due, <laughs> yes, I'm sitting at work and my supervisor calls the cop the cops on a black student in a wheelchair. All right, right, right. I end up getting pushed out of my job. This is a Friday that this happens, that application is due on Wednesday. And, it, and at this point, what stage is it in? It's like, uh, let's say 99.9% .9 done, but, you know, Regina gives intense feedback and no one gives feedback and I hadn't incorporated their feedback because I was like, oh, I'll do it. But that weekend, I remember because of like how traumatic having the cops come into a Black cultural center, trying to show up for students and really thinking about like, dang, a place that was a place of safety for me at the University of Arizona, the Black Cultural Center, is becoming a place where, like, I'm seeing, like, police and, like, people with guns show up. And so I remember I slept that whole weekend. And I remember Regina texted me and was like, as much as you can, like, just push through. Like, we have to work on Spencer. Like, your, your, fo your, your focus is Spencer. Your focus is Spencer. So essentially, like, Regina, I remember, was texting me throughout that weekend because I was just depressed and... I was having an identity crisis because, again, like, I was socialized into student affairs, right? I was an Aspenuff fellow, right? Like, I loved the work that I did, but I was also already experiencing cognitive dissonance. The most, like, the place that should have been a place of safety for not only me as a Black staff, but, like, Black students was just, like, violated. And I slept that whole weekend. That Monday comes. I'm type, 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 type. I'm type, 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 type. I'm, like, in the mode, right? That Tuesday... I go to campus to actually pick up a police report about the incident. And I am in the police station and I see the chief of police come out and everyone just start running. And then I start getting text messages from like the police officer came out, right? The police chief. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, what's going on? And then I started to get text messages from all these black students. Like there's a shooter on campus. There's a shooter on campus. There's a shooter next to Asa. 
And so me being the former director, I'm like, what? Like, what is happening? Remember, this is Tuesday. The application is due on Wednesday. A professor was murdered on our campus right next to where the Black Cultural Center was. And then the university sent out text messages saying that the person had a cap and a book bag. So Black students in our campus were being like harassed by cops, even though the suspect description did not meet. It was just like racist. And so it was like, I'm continuing with my dissertation that thinks about issues of identity and power. I just experienced like awful violent situation with cops. And now somebody is being murdered on our campus. And I need funding because I don't know what my life will look like if I can't find funding. Like, yes, the options are loans, right? Like the option would have had to be a loan. And institutions just will institution. <laughs> like, I don't even know how to say that more in a, like eloquently. Like, there was just so much happening. And so that Wednesday, it was due. And I remember I got up really, really early. Regina De La Man in Jamaica met me in an office and all this shit started happening right before the application was due. Like, you know how if you're on a mat and you're a word formatting when you like turn it into a word? Well, I was essentially doing my application in Google Docs. So then when I tried to convert it, like all the citations were off, like all the things that could go wrong went wrong. And I will acknowledge that like the National Academy of Education, like officers, like Angie Harmon at that point, like showed me grace because like, I honestly, whoever viewed my application showed me grace. Like my, the application I submitted is badass. I'm not going to like discount the work that I did, but there's a part in my application that says fine citation. <laughs> like <laughs> you, do you know how many times Regina Della and men told me as a grad student, like stop doing fine citation and just put the citation there. And then I'm submitting, like, a prestigious award with the freaking thing that says fine citation. And I'm like, what? Essentially, like, all the things that were happening in that moment were happening. And I was stressed out. I was tired. I was angry. I was having an identity crisis. And that's just, like, in work, right? That's not dealing with, like, me having an incarcerated parent at that time and still supporting my dad and my brother, Right. This isn't just the stuff that comes up in life because, like, life wise. This is just like what was happening at the University of Arizona in particular. That just was like, you're telling me not only did your cop, the cops come and storm the Black Cultural Center, but two days later, somebody was murdered on your campus in the same week. Yeah. A lot and of that time come up unexpectedly, and, and all these things were thrown your way to make it even more challenging to reach that finish line. But it also sounds like, Thank goodness you had a, an incredible team of support really lifting you up and saying, let's go. We're doing this. Come to the office. Let's go. I want to ask for those who are interested in applying to the dissertation fellowship, even though you set the intention of, I'm going to apply starting in April at ARA, about how much time do you think you really spent on the app? How much time do you think was really needed to write? And how many rounds of feedback did you get from your kitchen table? I would honestly say that if you're going to apply, I should have actually started writing in maybe January. So January of 2022, I should have started writing. I think some of the things also could have just been taken out of my, okay, this is such a like important question. It's such an important question. I would honestly say if I could go back, I would have started preparing my application maybe in that January, knowing that it was due in October. But I don't think it would have been like super intense, like I have to write every day. It would have been like, let me focus on this session, section, send it off for review and come back. You can have um, to process, meditate mm -hmm. on writing, go through more rounds yeah. of feedback. Okay, good. So you're, you're saying year to a year would be ideal for, for anyone yes. interested in applying. And I also how would say... You, how much time did you act, would you say you actually spent? Do you think you really wrote it in about a month? Oh, no, 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 no. A couple no. Months. It was a couple. It was a long time. It was a long time. So I think I had a great rough draft done, but what I needed to focus on and what I think my kitchen table, and I'm going to come back to kitchen table because what I talked about in terms of the kitchen table was just like faculty members. And it's not just about faculty. There were grass students who showed up for me, right? Like in my community who are part of my kitchen table as well. And so it was easier for me to get feedback from them before 
I would go to my like faculty, which is an interesting concept. And I think that like if you're in grad school, lean into your community, like lean into your kitchen table of other graduate students. So how many, and so you, how many people would you say actually re- read your app before you submit it? I would say four people in terms of faculty and three people in terms of um, students. Yeah. Because as I talked about earlier, when you're asking people, ask for things that are specific. So, for example, like when I was talking to Nolan, I wasn't asking Nolan about like the introduction, right, or my methods. I was talking to Nolan about my theory, like I guess methods, because I was talking about like working with Nolan about my theoretical contribution and then my significance to my scholarly significance. Then when I was working with like Regina, it was she was giving me overall feedback. So I had to be mindful of like, how was I engaging each person in their particular strengths? Not saying that like faculty are good at everything, like y'all are, but y'all are also busy. So I was trying to be strategic. Karina, right? She, I really say this is a piece of advice that everyone should take to heart. You don't know who's going to read your application. So Karina is a quant scholar, right? And so I was very strategic to have Karina read my application because she's a quant scholar. And she was giving me feedback around, like, I don't know what you just said here, <laughs> um, which she would never say, but it was like more eloquently. Right. And so I was thinking about how is my work getting across to both, you know, reviewers who are qualitative, who are not qualitative. Right. Because you don't know. And also like institutional ethnography, which is my method and methodology is not something that is real, like utilized in higher education scholarship. So I had to really think about like, I might get someone that's reading my application that has never heard of institutional ethnography. And then when I relied on like graduate students, like my best friend, Roman Christensen, she really just showed up for me just like as a writing partner, right? And I would ask like questions around syntax. And then I had two really good friends at UCLA that I got, we've gone through the programs together, like Audrey, who was also like a part of my kitchen table and we would just write together, right? And it was like, hey, Bren, like this looks really good. Or just like, you need those friends who are going to pump you up. Right. So she would like turn on Nipsey Hustle, right? Like for me and I would just write. And I think your kitchen table is all about like, how are you engaging in everyone's strengths? You don't also have the same expertise and knowledge. It's actually yeah. a benefit when they have different ways that they can come to that paper and say, hey, I don't know what this is. Like yep. more context. Give more of a definition. People in this field might not understand what that is. And that can be very, very helpful. I was, did you send each of them like a different Word doc to get feedback on? Or did you use just a Google doc and then everybody had access to the same document? How did you do that? I messed up on that because I did Google, but I gave everyone their own Google. Like, so I had, I still to this day have it. It's like, applications, fellowship applications, right? And then I have my Spencer Fellow application, Spencer NAD, and then like the rest of them. And so for Spencer NAD, I did this thing where I just created like their own, a copy of my application and just named it after who that person was. And I want to acknowledge that like also in the midst of like all the stuff that was happening my kitchen table had to also start responding to crisis from Black students because there was no longer a director. And so in that moment, Dr. Carol Brosheen showed up for me as well. And so I remember having to go back to like the Word document and make another copy for her. And she's in TLS at the University of Arizona, has no understanding of like, well, she has understanding of what higher education is, but isn't like trained in like the same things, right? And so individual Google document. I think the hard thing, though, was when I was getting competing feedback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you get, you got, uh, and now you have like seven different documents with different feedback and you've got to try to now synthesize it all back to one document. Mm-hmm. So then what I did is like what I would essentially do if I was getting reviewer feedback. So Dr. Brett Williams taught me this early is like when you're getting feedback from reviewers in like the R&R process, what I usually do is I'll break out my sections. And it's like, okay, this is the feedback that I got in the introduction. Okay. This is the feedback that I got into the literature review. Okay. And then I put each co- like reviewers comments. And so I did that method. Right. So then I was able to see, because I'm a visual and a talker type of person, I could see, okay, where are the areas where folks are giving me the same feedback? And then there were moments where I got like, oh, the chain feedback, 
right? We're like, I actually just did not agree with it. For example, I got feedback around, and you can see, um, I think sometimes, how am I trying to say this? Like you got feedback, but you really did not agree. You agree with. You had to push back on it. Yeah. And it was around like, I think I had put something in there, like in my fellowship application, like like institutions of higher education are like racist. Like I know that, right? But there was feedback of like, okay, you maybe have described it, but how are you analyzing what you just said based on your theoretical framework? And some of the other things, right? Because I think it's not a thing I know because now I'm like in this and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share. But when you're developing these, and I think Ashley, you can agree as someone who's also gotten prestigious awards, there's so many people that are applying for these things. So you have to think about like, In that first paragraph or that first like introduction of what you're, how you're coming into your study, like what is that cliffhanger? Mm -hmm. And so one of the pieces of feedback that I got, it wasn't a cliffhanger, but time and time again, and I picked this up by listening to other people. And I remember I actually heard this advice at Spencer in San Diego when I heard someone else who was applying for a fellowship where they were a finalist. And I could talk about what that process looked like, like how you know where you're at. And I heard someone say they're th- they want to know how is your study making, like what type of contribution is your study making? And I think, again, because of socialization, because of how we put people on pedestals, I'm doing work on campus sexual violence, right? I was taught by Dr. Linder as a master's student who is well, like, like has paved the way in terms of like campus sexual violence research and higher ed. And then Jessica Harris, who was just like brilliant. And so I remember when I was going into my, like, how is my study significant? I was like, how am I making an argument, right? And it's not an argument against, and I had to, like, reframe my brain, right? Because it wasn't an argument against their work. It was an argument about how my work was going to be additive to this, right? Of, like, yes, they've done all these things, and this person has done this, but this is how my work fits in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, right, with campus sexual violence research, it was focused on an individual level. It was focused on a macro, and my work is more organizationally bound, right, of, like, what is actually happening when we think about safety? So in the feedback and things and the pieces around like where the focus is, there was three things that I focused on. And I'm actually, I have like something here. And so in my first, inter- like when I'm introdu- like introducing, right, I'm talking a little about my study and I have like three sentences where I just go straight in so that I can bring the readers along. And I'm like, this inquiry, it makes a theoretical and policy contribution in this way, right? My work does this, right? It fills this empirical gap. And so I was very mindful of like doing that at the beginning instead of sometimes how we're trained as doctoral students doing that at the end. The beginning, because the introduction or like in the project goals or in the beginning of that description of the dissertation or towards the end of the... I did it in the introduction, in the inter- right? I frame the, pro- I frame the problem. I introduced like my theoretical like conceptualization, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And then I was like, this is how my conceptualization is a theoretical and a policy contribution. And this is how my work will fill an empirical gap. Mm-hmm. And then when I got to significant of study, I saw it as like a sandwich, right? Of like that nice little piece of bread where I was like, Linda and Jessica have done this, right? Khan and Hirsch have done this, but my work is an organizational analysis and this is how it fits. And it was beautiful. Mm-hmm. But again, if I didn't have my kitchen table who gave me that feedback, right? If I wasn't willing to work through like perfectionism, I would have never been able to pick up these like little pieces that people were dropping. Like imagine if I wasn't at San Diego being nosy and hearing someone else's conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Like, I was getting those appetizers. That's all I got to say. Sorry, Spencer. Right. And and how many times do you, do you think your kitchen table read and gave feedback? Regina, I think, read it the most because she's my advisor and she was also a writer letter. I met with Nolan twice and he gave feedback. Kanina gave me feedback once. Britt gave me feedback periodically whenever she could. But I think the person that read it the most was Regina. And I remember that because shit was hitting the fan. That Tuesday night, I gave my best draft that I could do. And then I remember like, oh, shit, I still have so much feedback. So that Wednesday, it was like, get to the office, team type and cry. And it was hard because it was like, I was team typing and crying on Pacific Coast time 
with the 12 p.m. deadline, East Coast deadline, right? Well, 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time deadline. But I was so emotionally tired and I was carrying so much that I remember when I actually pressed submit, I can't even describe like what my body felt like because it was like it's submitted, but now it's the waiting game and no one prepares you for the waiting game. Okay. Before we talk about the way, and and I know we're coming towards the end of the conversation, but I would like anything, any tips on organizing the application, how you you did a little bit, give us insight into sandwiching the significance, presenting that early on and also at the end, any other tips or advice on just how you approached putting that application together? Yes, I have lots of tips. (laughs) Okay. So, um, and I will also acknowledge that all these tips I'm giving you, the great Regina Delaman gave me. And then, yeah, like she also has just taught me so much. Yeah, she's like amazing. She is so amazing. We can have another conversation later about advisors and the importance of advisors. So my pieces of things is Google works like with sharing documents, things like that. Always save your drafts. I remember like on this document, it says B2, B9 final. I was on version nine of like my fellowship, right? Yeah. Because every time I was like, okay, I'm ready. And then I was like, oh, shit, I need to go back. Because towards the end, you have to pull off of Google or you'll be in the same situation where like my formatting was so off and it was like the crunch of time. So that's the piece of organization. I also relied on appendices in my application. So one of the things that I did is I showed a piece of my data because I entered my da- I entered my um, dissertation using social media data. So I put examples of the social media data that I analyzed in order to create my theoretical like framework or um, theoretical contribution to research. And I think that was really good for like the reviewers to see, because if you're like, oh, I went on social media and I did this or I followed this hashtag, they're going to be like, okay. But like them being able to see it was like really good. Like I literally screenshot pieces of my data from social media. So I could like show them how I was like, again, thinking about this organizationally. Then I took my research questions. I had like my research questions on one side and then how each data collection method was helping answer that research question, which again helped because you got to think those reviewers are reviewing hundreds of applications, right? Mm -hmm. And so what are they going to remember? And then my final thing that I did, I actually, when I conceptualize the campus safety apparatus, I didn't only conceptualize it in words, I visualized it. I worked with one of my dear comrades, Tahan Kenema, who is currently at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she does a lot of like art-based social justice work. Um, and so she, she's like a super badass like photographer. And I remember being like, I can conceptualize this in my head, but like art is not my forte. And so I remember like being in her office with her and drawing my theoretical like contribution, right? And then her helping me actually create it. And so I was also able to submit that. So then when the reviewers were reading my application, they're like, oh, when Brenna's talking about the campus safety apparatus and what it's actually doing, this is what she means. Mm. And so I would say my piece of advice is like where you can lean on appendices so that you can say, See appendix appendix X or see this whatever. How many did you um, do you know or remember? Data and research questions, pieces of my data, and then my campus safety apparatus three, okay. three, three, yeah, three editions. Because you can't get everything in ten pages. No offense, Spencer and AD, y'all. It's really, tight. it's tight. But and but another the, thing, and the, but the appendices are unlimited. Yes. No way. I mean. There's room. There's room. So I want to say, like, I appreciate my advisor for that because um, taking her, like, I took intro to call with her and I loved it so much. I ended up taking, like, Black Feminist Methodology and then I ended up taking, like, Advanced Qualitative Research and doing all these, like, additional qual things that what I learned in Regina's class and intro, I was able to take into my other classes and then other students were like, oh, my God, where did you learn that? Where did you learn that? And it's like having a good professor or a mentor that is like understands their qualitative work it's like it can either make or break you in the academy so crucial so you idea it sounds like you presented this campus safety apparatus which is your own theoretical framework 
based mm-hmm. on different pieces of work that you combined and merged together. And then you consulted with a friend and artist to help you represent that knowledge visually. But now that I like am in the dissertating, it's getting even like it's going to become even more visualized, right? Because with my with institutional ethnography, right, it's the ruling relations, the power. And so now I'm at this kind of crossroads where it's like, how do I visualize power? Right. Like I'm hearing these stories, I'm hearing these qualitative pieces. And so I'm like, that's actually what excites me. Right. Of like that visual piece of like, mm-hmm. here is what's happening. Right. Here is how the campus safety apparatus is mediating safety. Right. Based on like, yeah. So I, it excites me. I'm not an artist. I know you are. And that's why I think you're so cool. <laughs> um, but yeah. So lean one, you only know what you know. And my black auntie told me that. You only know what you know, and I know a little bit about a little bit, and that's all I know. When you don't know something, it's fine. Outsource lean on your community. Yeah. Yep. Any other tips you would recommend for students who are interested in applying for organizing the application? I think we've touched on a, gr- a lot of great points. Timing, revision, organization, the significant section designing your own methodology, the use of an appendix. I think some other pieces are the questions with Spencer. They have you submit like supplemental questions, like in 500 words or less. Like it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Like doing those questions is really hard. One of them was like, as a result of my study, and then you have to finish it, you get like 500 words. And it's like, how am I supposed to answer that? I would also say have fun with that question too. Um, And have fun with those like open-ended responses. And then be you. Like, I remember naming, like, in my application or when I had to follow up, right? Like, so when you're on, what's the word, a finalist, they reach out to you and they're asked, they ask you, like, okay, where you are, where are you at in terms of, like, your data collection and things? And I remember going back to, like, what I said I was going to do and where I was because of, like, all the trauma and the fact that, like, my body when he literally went into, like, I was, I was sick for months, like, months. So they reached out. Because you were a finalist, but you didn't know yet if you had actually received the award. And how much time, what's that wait time look like? So I submitted in October. I got an email like two weeks before ARA. The next ARA in Chicago. Yep. So like like March, I was notified that like I was a finalist. And they give you a, a week to respond to questions and update them where you are with your project. And so in my project, I had said, like, my original application, I was like, by October, I would complete all of my X, Y, and Z. Well, I got sick. I experienced violence. Black students were experiencing violence. Like, our university was in shambles. And so I had to be honest. Like, I wasn't able to get what I said done, but this is how I'm getting it done now. And this is how I'm getting it done with the support of my advisor and my community. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's hard to be honest about where you're at because you want these folks to fund you. But I think honesty is the best policy. So I think just like be honest, like just be honest. Don't try to be sneaky. Don't be like, oh yeah, I'm right on target. No, be transparent. Say the XYZ has happened. I've had to shift, but this is what I'm doing to move forward and keep it pushing. Do you know how many people were finalists at this point? Do you know? Um, 65. It was 65 people who were finalists. The hardest thing was I went to ARA and they like, you're, they don't tell you. Who other finalists are. Yeah, they don't tell you. And I also, again, because where I was situated, I told my community, I think I had told you at ARA that I was a finalist. Yeah, yeah. But it was hard for me to tell people, right? It was really, really hard. And so I told it like a few people. And the reason why I didn't want to tell everyone was because they're, I knew like there was so much happening. Like I had applied for four fellowships and I was tired. I remember by the time I got to the Ford Foundation Fellowship, I had text my advisor and I was like, I don't think I can do this. Like I'm so exhausted. And the only thing I've been doing is writing. Is it okay if I not submit this one and I'll just have to deal with whatever happens? And she just was like, Bren, like I've seen you going and going and going. Like you got to take care of yourself, love. Like you deserve rest. And I appreciate Regina for that. So as ARA, I'm there, and the fellows, like the prior year's fellows, were giving like their, you know, presentations. And I remember like I'm meeting them, and I didn't tell them I was a finalist, right? And then again, I hear about the Spencer party. 
I'm like, and then I hear it's at, you know, the the fancy, the art museum, the art institute in Chicago. And I was like, oh, shoot. But this year they told people, if you're not on the guest list, you're not getting in. I made my way in. <laughs> but I remember my advisor is there, right? And I'm like, Regina, I'm just going to walk in. I'm just going to act like they don't see me. I don't know how I made my way into this reception. <laughs> But I remember, like, I started to just get, like, so nervous and so anxious. And she pulled me to the side and she's like, Bren, I don't tell, I don't give people compliments just to give people compliments. But, like, your work is so important and it's new and it's refreshing. Like, be confident in what you've done because that's what's going to propel you. And I said, yes, ma'am. So then I just started to talk, right? Started to meet people. And I found myself, like, becoming confident about talking about my work. And I didn't know this at the time, but I was talking to someone that I later found out was like an officer. And I remember being like, yeah, like my work is going to change higher education, like being the nerdy, like PhD candidate that I am not realizing, like, even though like the officers like don't have a say in who actually is a finalist. But essentially, like the Spencer reception was cool. I got to meet like some really awesome people and scholars. And again, that food was amazing. Like, it was amazing, y'all. I I feel like Sai on Real Housewives just, like, sitting here talking about food. But it was so good. I'm not, not like, Sai, though. I'm not like Sai. (laughs) But, yes, ARE was fun. And then I remember the next day, everyone was leaving. I still hadn't found out from Spencer. And I was sitting in the middle of Starbucks, Michigan Avenue. And I got an email that I was a alternative for the American Association for Undergraduate Women. Uh, Okay, the other fellowship that you had been working on even prior to the Spencer. Okay, good. Yes, and it was heartbreaking, y'all. So let's talk about those no's. It was freezing cold in Chicago. It started to snow. You remember, it started to snow. And I live in Arizona, so I was not prepared. And I just started crying because everything that went wrong was starting to go wrong that day. And I remember just crying at Starbucks, just crying. And I remember texting Regina to update her, texting Nolan to update him, texting Karina, texting like, you know, my community, like my people, right? And every one of them kept saying, it's fine. You're still a finalist for Spencer. Put a smile on your face. Rejection is tough, but you can do it. And I think like in that moment, like it was hard because when you grow up in foster care, when you experience so much instability in life, right? Rejection feels... Oh, I feel like I can go into a therapy section, a session right now. Like it is, it's rough, right? And you need people who are tender with you to say, it's okay. Like feel that emotion. So I had my time to process and I was fine. And then on 420, 420, right? I was sitting at home and I remember joking around with my advisor. I said, no matter where I am, as soon as I hear from Spencer, you're the first person I'm calling. I was on the toilet when I got the email from Spencer. So I'm mid toilet and I get up and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm about to FaceTime Regina. And it was Regina's birthday. Yeah. It was my advisor's birthday. And I got to be like, your Z is a National Academy of Education fellow. And I remember, yes. Yeah, it was like such a beautiful thing, like such a beautiful thing. And I just felt like so celebrated by her. And I just have such a tender relationship with her, like someone that pushes me, challenges me. And it's been so interesting because in my dissertation study, right, I talk to um, survivors and I say, what does safety look like for you, right? Like, what is safety? And in those moments and thinking about standpoint and thinking about like the campus safety apparatus and what that is and how it's maintained, like to be seen, to be heard and to be understood in the academy is like the greatest gift, right? And that gift I've been able to experience with Regina. And I can't say that about like every faculty member or every scholar that like I've come in contact with. And so I'm excited because one of the things and one of the reasons why when I ended up finding out that like not only did I get the National Academy of Education Fellow, but I ended up actually ended up getting the the Association for Undergraduate Women um, American Dissertation Fellowship Award. And I had to choose between both of them, which is so fucked up, like. As someone who grew up in immense poverty, who turns down $25,000? I'm just going to look like this on the screen because, like, really, 
But what kept me with NAAB was that mentorship opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. To be mentored by like scholars in the academy that like AUW didn't necessarily have. And to be able to be in this like real cohort method, a cohort bill and engage with other scholars who are like also dissertating. So I've become like friends with um, a girl who's doing this amazing, like awesome project on like educational resistance in Palestine. And I'm like, heck yeah, like free Palestine, but also like thinking about education, right? Mm -hmm. And then I just found out last week that like my National Academy of Education mentor is the Lee Patel. Like, whoa. And this is someone who like, I've read their work and they're like, my sole parent that doesn't know I exist. (laughs) Yes. But like you're, so I'm like, I'm so excited because I remember like one time I had a quick conversation with Lee. I remember walking away and being like, they're like your everyday person, like just human. And so I'm excited to like experience that tenderness with like Lee and with, you know, this new doctoral student that I'm connecting with and the other ones that like I will be connecting with. Because again, like to be seen, to be heard and to be understood in the academy is such a beautiful thing. And because of individualism sometimes, right? Like I said this earlier, like kids from the hood, we I didn't get to dream as a kid, right? Dreaming was the only thing. And when I remember, I would say, one day I'm going to do this. And my math teacher was awful to me, right? And I, I hate math still to this day because of it. But I remember in my doctoral coursework, I was like, I'm not just going to take stats. I'm going to take multivariate regressions, right? And so just because you like wanted to not cultivate a dream doesn't mean like I stopped there, right? Like it might have not happened when I was, you know, in high school, but now I'm a scholar that I can like read these like concepts around like stats and actually know what I'm like, you know, reading and like understanding the data, right? And so individualism is a thief of joy in the academy find your community and really just like focus on like being who you are. Oh my goodness. Thank you. We're going to have to pause there and hopefully bring you back on for another (laughs) follow-up episode just to hear more about navigating that process, accepting the fellowship, and then hopefully hear more about how Spencer has helped you as a scholar. So definitely would love to have you back on in the future as an update episode. Thank you so much for coming on, Bren. You are an incredible storyteller and so vulnerable, so transparent and candid. And I think it's really refreshing to listen and hear and and learn from. Yes. So lastly, before I let you go, can you share any resources for listeners who are interested in your work or interested in writing for proposals? Yes. I have a few different recommendations or resources Number one, particularly for folks in higher education, it is okay to leave the bounds of higher education to go learn some stuff. So for example, like prior to me doing institutional ethnography work, I think I had found one other scholar who had published around institutional ethnography in higher education. And um, that's Casey up at University of North Dakota or North Dakota State, one of those. And I remember reaching out to them and kind of understanding the method because I was really interested in like you know, the correlations around power. And I really thought about like, how can I take this and think about it institutionally around sexual violence? And with that, you can only read so much. And if it's not like widely talked about, you have to think about how do you leave the bounds of higher ed? And so I sent the emails, right? I found like Dorothy Smith, like the person who created institutional ethnography, right? And then other people have worked with her. And then I found myself a part of like this international group of like graduate and PhD folks from across the world who are engaging with institutional ethnography. So in the UK and in Canada and other places, like institutional ethnography is like widely used. And so there are moments where like I'm getting up at 7 a.m. so I can go to these like mentoring talks, but it's really helped me to really understand the method and also understand, you know, the confines of the method and how my work and how my like framework and what I'm bringing will expand that and rethink about it, rethink it in a little bit-ish way. (laughs) Some of the other resources is I think that it's important for you to breathe a little bit with writing. I purchased a book called They Say, I Say. It was like $5. It's like one of the newer, it was one of the older iterations of the book, but it's been really good for me to go back when I am actually making the arguments to figure out how am I not using the first introduction every time I'm talking about a particular point. And so it's also like helped my writing in many, many ways because it's kind of like a thesaurus, but 
for writing and there's also like prompts and stuff. So it's like, if you're making an argument, if you're making a comparison, like just like basic level writing. And I read the book in like maybe three days and then I've have it like tabbed. It's like my new APA manuals, like source um, or APA manual, right? Like my APA manual is like about to fall apart. Like this book is now about to fall apart. Other resources, again, engage in the work. So if I'm doing work on abolition, right, I need to make sure that I'm staying up to date with abolition. And I'm also reading scholars outside of higher ed. Like, yes, I'm reading and engaging with like Charles H. Davis's work, right? But I'm also leaving education and thinking about like Derricka Purnell, um, you know, Mark Lamont Hill, who I had the pleasure of meeting at the um, socialism conference, who does anthropology cultural work, which is very connected to like institutional ethnography. And so I guess like in short, like read, you know, like there's a joke that I would always say when I was, you know, supervising folks. I'd be like, some people just don't read and you can tell. (laughs) And in the academy, in the academy, we have whole ass people with PhDs and who are faculty members that don't read, but will get up on a stage and talk about that theory or that concept. So release yourself from the bounds and the constraints of your specific academic discipline and move elsewhere. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Tell the listeners where they can find you for anyone who's interested in getting a hold of you. Yes. For folks who want to stay connected, you can just feel free to send me an email. I created this email in high school and I still have it. Brenda Lee Anderson 10 at gmail.com. That's the email that I stay up to date with because at some point I'll be off to a new institution. If you want to find me on Twitter or X with Twitter, you can find me at Brenda Lee XO, B-R-E-N-D-A-L-E-E-X-O. And I would just let you know, as it says in my bio, I'm usually there for the secret sneaker drops. I'm a sneakerhead. But if you want to engage, I like stuff. You know, I'm a fake uh, social media person. And then I am on Instagram. And you can find me at Bryn Lee XO, so B-R-E-N-L-E-E-X-O. And I also have a community of grad students that I write with on a weekly basis. And so if you're interested in just being in community with or you need support or feedback or someone to make a really good playlist for you, reach out. Like, you need me to be your high person. I got you. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining Willing to Learn and sharing your wisdom and your experiences with listeners. Really appreciate it. Thanks.